He's worked with 56 NCAA teams. David Kitchen was destined to coach a Division I football team, but he walked away to build his own business instead. Wise beyond his years and armed with a degree focus in sports psychology, as a strength and conditioning coach, Kitchen has helped advance the careers of numerous National Football League and Canadian Football League prospects. Kitchen's Edge Leadership Academy helps businesses and sports teams turn words into actions, providing them with a systematic leadership development program. His book, The Pyramid, a system for developing tomorrow's leaders today, is available on Amazon. Please welcome David Kitchen. Wow, that might have been the best intro I've ever had. So <laughs> let me know what your fee is to come with me on the road, because that, that was phenomenal. Thank you. So you mentioned that you saw hardship and addiction in your early life. Are you okay with elaborating a little bit on that or telling us what you can? Absolutely. And it's one of those things, I talk a lot about authentic leadership and I talk a lot about being yourself. And so one of the things that I try and do in my own life is show up, I say scars and all, show up with everything and be who you are. So yeah, I saw some things at a young age that you know, some children maybe shouldn't see. I don't want to paint it to be some A&E late night special. It wasn't. My mother was absolutely phenomenal and worked two jobs to make sure that we had food on the table, although that food may have been from what was left at the restaurant she was working at or, or wherever it may have came from. But she made sure we never missed a meal. And unfortunately, you know, I never met my father, my stepfather, my brother's dad was an addict. And so that was tough at times. There were some times that he was very verbally abusive towards my mother. And so we did see some things at, at a young age that kind of forced me to grow up. And we joke about it, that, that most people become a man at 18. Mine became a man at 11. But that being said, it also gave me experiences and a resiliency, I believe, that that a lot of kids don't necessarily have. Because I did have certain experiences at a young age, and I was asked a lot growing up. I was surrounded by people that love me. I was surrounded by a mother who worked unbelievably hard and tirelessly to play the man and the woman and the mother and the father of a household and, and fit in very, very well with the football dads growing up, watching me and my brother play. And I had a grandmother who was there as well and provided us eventually with a home to live in and a more structured life. While my mom went back to school and my mom ended up pursuing a degree in nursing, she's now a care director at an Alzheimer's facility. So yeah, you know, I, I saw some things that again were, were difficult, but it also showed me at a young age that that life can be hard. And through that, I learned really quickly that you can't lose if you don't give up because that's what I saw from my mom. Um, and so that was always my mentality growing up is that I can never lose if I just don't quit. What was your escape in those days? Did you watch sports at that time or what things did you like to do at that time it's, for it's example so... I used to watch hockey and used to make up stories about makeup games and draw and stuff so what did yeah, you used to do so I've had one speed my whole life and that's full speed ahead as fast as possible I was anything that I could find that would make me stronger, faster, or anything was my escape that meant I was the kid that would ride a bike down the biggest hill in town and try and jump it over over a car or over whatever I could. But ironically, my stepdad at one point brought home a weight set. It was an old like Walmart version of like a weight bench with just old plates on it. And that was my escape. As soon as I found that, like that was where I would go. I remember just cranking out repetitions of the same exercises. The only things that I knew, I was 11, 12, 13 years old at the time, um, cranking out just little exercises that I knew and just going until my arms were numb. And I loved it. And I was like, this is awesome. I didn't know that would become my career 15 years later, but it was definitely sports were my escape from day one. I'm super competitive in everything that I do. So any opportunity, whether it was playing football in the streets, we were the kids that we knew when mom went from one job to the second, she would yell for us. And that meant that it was time for us to come home and that we had to get out of the streets or wherever we were, whether it was playing football basketball, kickball, baseball, whatever we could, or riding skateboards and bikes. I was always going. That was my escape from everything. So it was your grandmother that <clears throat> helped you get out of that environment or what else 
Yeah. So long story short, my stepfather left and was no longer in the picture, which was a blessing in disguise for us. But as he left, he left my mom in financial ruin. I mean, he really did a number on everything that we had built, even though it wasn't much, he took it with him. And so we were kind of in a place where we didn't know what we were going to do. And my grandmother didn't know the extent of everything that was going on. My mom's a very proud woman, so she didn't share everything. And through that process, it all came out. And grandma kind of stepped in and said, hey, you're coming here. And it was also part of the underlying thing was that it was a better school district and there was a great football program. At the time, I was already an oversized 12-year-old. So it was it was kind of in the back of their minds, they were like, it would be a better opportunity for him to come and play here as he grew up and be in a more structured area out of the town. I grew up in a very blue-collar, coal region town, and so it wasn't a great environment regardless at the time we were living above a bar. And so obviously that wasn't a great environment for myself and my brother. And grandma kind of stepped in and said, Hey, all right, you guys are coming to live with us. My mom wanted to go back to school. That was what got us out of there. It was again, my mom's resiliency. And then the love of my grandmother to say, Hey, come live with me. And so we moved from being in the middle of town to this rural area where like our closest neighbors were a mile away and they were cows. Um, so it was a complete shift for me. But it was the best thing that ever happened to us. And the best thing that ever happened to us as a family. She supported us while my mom went back to school and made sure that there was structure and things for us to do. We joke about it. We say that she tamed the wild child because me and my brother were so used to being able to run around because my mom was working so much. Now, all of a sudden, we had this structured environment and it shifted us, you know. But again, bringing it back to leadership, I was lucky because I was able to see strong female role models from a very young age, but it also, I think, gave me kind of a blank slate going into coaching and going into being around male role models because I never had a positive male role model in my life. I think I went into it with kind of a different view than other kids that grew up with a dad and grew up with certain things did. Was it difficult to get into college? And is that where you saw sports as your future? Uh, No, so I was really lucky. I moved to a town called Borough, Pennsylvania, which to give you kind of a little context on that, it's basically if you took Friday Night Lights, the movie about Odessa, Texas, and you dropped it in rural Pennsylvania, that was what it was about. I mean, there's literally signs in town that say God family football, and it is a religion. So we grew up playing high school ball. Um, You played in front of 12,000 people every weekend, and it was packed, and the town shut down on Friday nights, and I was fortunate enough to be a good football player. And obviously I fell in love with the weight room at a very young age. So that gave me kind of a step ahead of other people. I was recruited out of high school. I was kind of the typical sob story where I was highly recruited as a junior, ended up getting hurt. I blew my knee. The scholarship offers went away and I ended up at a small school in Pennsylvania to play football because nobody else offered me. So I got this opportunity to go and play at this small school I never lived up to my potential. I let some of the the demons of my past get the best of me. I was a loose cannon off the field, to be honest with you, and didn't take advantage of that opportunity. And then that was kind of what pushed me. It was almost like I lost football by my own hand because it was my own fault. I was like, okay, I'm going to move into something different. So I got into business, actually, and I graduated with a business degree because that was the easiest degree that I could get to go play football. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to get this. I started selling IT systems out of college. Oh, wow. I hated it. It was (laughs) awful. I was in a shirt and tie every day and I was driving around and trying to convince people to put these new IT systems into their businesses. And I was good at it. I was good at sales. I just hated what I was doing. I got really lucky. A friend of mine who was a former coach when I was growing up called me and he said, hey, I got a head coaching job at a local high school. Do you want to help out? And that was like, for me, that was something bigger than me sending me a message of, hey, this is what you're supposed to do. I started coaching there and I did it for a year and I loved it. I went to my family and I went to my mom and I said, hey, I think I'm going to quit my job and try and coach full time. And at the time, nobody really knew what that meant for me and what that would look like. It required me to shift my mindset. It required me to shift the way I handled myself. And it put a sense of responsibility on me that I hadn't had before because now I had to be the role model. So I think that was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I wrote letters to every Division I college in, on the East Coast, and I said, I will come work in your weight room for free. Um, I will come right now, whatever. And luckily, Todd Hammer at Robert Morris University gave me an opportunity, 
And he said, you can come work for free, man. So I quit my job, <laughs> packed everything I had in, into mm -hmm. my the time, drove to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, lived in, it was actually an old abandoned high school that they turned into one bedroom apartments. And it was in a sketchy area outside Pittsburgh and I paid all cash for rent <laughs> and I moved in and, and that was that. And that was kind of where it started and the career went from there. But yeah, that's how I got into coaching. So why you? What was it about your coaching techniques, personality, and leadership style that drew so many teams into your orbit? You know, honestly, I, I think it's just my approach to people. Uh, I talk about my coaching style and I say all the time, I'm an open book. I, I was always known for allowing other coaches to come and watch me and I would give them my notes and my programs and things like that. I never gate kept, kept anything because I always said, you can have what I do, but you can't do it like we do it. And the reason for that was always, I felt my relationship with my players, my guys and girls, regardless of the team and the sport, they knew that I would go to the end of the earth for them. And I genuinely meant that. And, and it's something that I still do to this day when I meet new people. Uh, one of my values that I fight for in my life is honesty. And so when I first meet people, a few conversations into it, I look people in the eye and I genuinely say, I will never lie to you. And I truly mean that. Now, has it burned me in the past? Absolutely. Because I've had to say some things that maybe people didn't want to hear or whatever. But I think when you set that precedent with people and you genuinely listen to them, listen to understand not to answer. Okay. So, so listening to people and actually wanting to understand what makes them tick, I think was one of the things that set me apart. And then just the mentors that I had was another thing. I had great coaches and great people around me that poured into me. They gave me an opportunity at a young age. I was the youngest head strength coach in the country at 24 years old. That gave me an opportunity to shape my coaching identity around myself. Everybody that I was around were like, you can't be anybody but you. So just be the best version of you. And so that's where it kind of came from. As I got older, I kind of used that as, as part of my relationship style, that I'm going to be me every day of the week. And you know who you're going to get with me, whether it's 5 a.m. or it's 5 p.m. I'm the same guy. I tell kids when they come on campus, when they would do recruiting visits, I'd always have their families look around my office and talk to me. And I'd say, what do you not see in here that you see in other offices? And the answer was usually championship rings. I would joke about it. And I said, it's not because I don't win them. I've won championships. I've been fortunate enough to win a lot. I don't ever take the ring. I've never taken a championship ring. And the reason for that is simple. I feel that the relationships are always more important than the ring. And so the pictures of me and my former players, the wedding invites, things like that are what's on my office walls. There's no championship rings sitting around my office collecting dust. Now, the competitive side of me also says my favorite ring is the next one. I don't keep them for that reason, but I also don't keep them because the relationships are what matters to me. Then you had the opportunity of a lifetime. Explain to those who don't know much about the NCAA, NCAA football, how big a deal Division I coaching job is. Yeah, so I believe there is 148 NCAA, NCAA Division I programs, and then of that, there's what's called the power five and the group of five. So there's 10 school or 10 conferences basically that are the, the top of the top. I was 25 and I got an opportunity at UNLV to come out and be the assistant director. So to be the number two person in charge of all the football training for that program. I was 25 years old. I was the youngest in division one and I got the opportunity to go to Vegas. I got the job offer on a Wednesday. I was living in Pennsylvania Got the job offer on a Wednesday. I said, when do you need me? They said, we booked you a flight for tomorrow. We need you on Friday. So I got about two days to pack my life up and get on a plane with, I literally had a book bag and a duffel bag and then took care of all my belongings later. I had two seasons there and it was the opportunity of a lifetime. I mean, you go from coaching division two and division three where I was, and then all of a sudden you're flying on charter jets and you're eating five-star restaurants and you're around the elite of the elite in everything that they do from the coaching staff to the athletic trainers, to the players, to the academic support. I mean, everything is, it's just a different world. Uh, and so for me, I was extremely lucky to be able to experience that, not just in football, but also then make it back there in basketball as well. I'm one of the few people to have coached at that level in both sports. Wow. Are you nuts? Yes, absolutely. 
hundred percent. I've got a screw loose and, and everybody knows it. <laughs> so what were your next steps after that building the business that you have now? Yeah, I guess that's why you're asking if I'm nuts. So the contract came, my contract came up and the way that a college coaching, college NCAA contracts, especially the division one level work is they're predicated by the head coach of the sport team. So if you're a football strength and conditioning coach or a basketball strength and conditioning coach, usually your head coach is in charge of your contract. So if there's a head coaching change, you basically have to interview for your job. Right. And so I was at Georgia Southern the year of the pandemic. We had a 22 win season as a basketball program. We were actually on the plane getting ready to go to March Madness and when everything got shut down. And so as we got back to, to our campus, our head coach got offered another job and he left. And so we were all kind of in limbo. Everybody else on the staff is in limbo because you don't know who's going to get to go with the new with him to his new job, who's going to stay. I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And so I decided to stay and they brought the new head coach in and I had to interview for my job. Basically, the summer was going to be my interview. I started the summer and something just wasn't sitting right with me. I felt like there was something else that I needed to do. And I knew that leadership was something that I was passionate about. I had done a lot of work on myself and a lot of work on exploring what my interests were and what my passions were. There was also this piece of uh, I wanted control of my own life. I no longer wanted to be at the beck and call of somebody else and no longer wanted to be subject to this win or go home lifestyle, which is what it was. You could live in one state on Monday and you could be in another state on Tuesday and there's nothing you can do about it. We sat down and he slid the contract uh, across the table to me. We had the conversation. It was a 50% a pay raise, meaning it would have almost doubled my salary. And I couldn't sign it. I don't know why. It was one of those moments in life where you're just like, I don't know what came over me. I don't know what it was, but I just couldn't sign it. And so I said, can I have a day? Can I have 24 hours? And, and that's a big ask at that level. Oh, um, yeah. They thought you were nuts, yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They thought I was nuts, too. And luckily, he respected my decision. And I said, OK, I'm going to take 24 hours and think on this. And I went home and I sat down and I called my mom and I just said, Mom, I don't think I want to do this anymore. And she's like, are you out of your mind? Like, you mean, you've worked the last nine years to get to this place. You really want to do this? I said, yeah, I think I'm going to start a business. And from there, I went in the next day and I said, coach, I appreciate the opportunity. But thank you so much, but I'm going to pass. I'm going to walk away. And I don't think that a lot of head coaches hear that because the look on his face was kind of like, you're like going to Yeah, you're, 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 <laughs> going to, you're going to do what? So I did. I walked away. <laughs> And I was living in rural Georgia, had no family, no friends down there outside of the coaching community. And I went online and Googled, how do you start an LLC? <laughs> and that was how it started. The next thing I knew, I was, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to teach leadership skills to people using these experiences that I've had, using this sports psychology degree that I have. And then I thought to myself, well, this might not be enough. So that night I filed my LLC paperwork and I also applied for my PhD. And I figured I'll go back to school and get a PhD. At no point during that did I think to myself, how are you going to pay your bills? That just didn't even cross my mind. I was just like, no, these are the things that I need to do to be successful in this new endeavor that I'm trying to take on. I went back to school and started my PhD in psychology, launched Edge Leadership Academy, went to YouTube University and figured out how to build a website and how to figure out sales funnels and, and marketing and things that you have to go along with building a business. It's been a wild couple of years since then, but it's been one of the best decisions I've ever made. Well, in reality, that is kind of badass. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was a wild move, but you know what? My whole life, I bet on myself. It's just something. I always think it's the safest bet. I think betting on yourself is the safest bet mm -hmm. because you can control it. And I said, when I started the business, I might fail. There's a chance that all of this could come crashing down. And because as you know, once you get out, it's hard to get back in. It is. Uh, so I knew that by not signing that contract, I was essentially telling the rest of the business, I'm done. So I knew that what came with that. And I was willing to accept it because I said, if I fail, at least I failed trying. At least I went down the way I wanted to go down. And it's by my own hand. And I can live with that. And really, that's probably one thing that people kind of don't get is that what's the worst that can happen, right? You're going to lose some money. You might be broke for a while. 
you might be broke for a long while. You might have to move back with your mom, but at least you know you tried. And instead of being on your deathbed wondering, what if I did that and it worked out? But what do you see as people's biggest inhibitor to growth besides this? I think it's exactly what you just said. Number one, not dreaming big enough, not having the idea. And, and this was something that changed. Not my going mind. after it. Yeah, not going after it. I wrote a five-year plan of profitability when I wrote the business plan. Within six months, we were profitable. And I decided that I was the king of entrepreneurs. So now I was going to launch an empire and I was going to do all these things. So I opened a gym. Six months into starting this first business, I started a second business and I opened a gym. But the gym was a great move because it got me in the room with other people that were successful. I had lunch with this entrepreneur who I now do business with in consulting. But at the time, his son went to the gym and I just asked him if we could have lunch. And he said something to me that was really, really interesting. And he explained, you know, that a lot of people, when they look at successful families and they look at people that have changed generational wealth, so to say, they don't realize that there was somebody in that family that decided to think differently. It wasn't always that way. And so every family needs one person. It just takes one to change the trajectory of your whole family. And my vision for my life has always been to leave a legacy for my family to be proud of. And I think that to me, that means that I have to be the one. I have to be the one in my family to think differently. I have to be the one in my family to change the way we think about money, to change the way we think about business, about what's possible. I think for a lot of people, what inhibits them is not getting clear on what it is they want for their life, really getting clear. So everybody that we hire at Edge, I require them to sit down and write a vision, mission, and value statement for their life. I want them to know very clearly what they want in life, how they're going to get there, and what values they fight for. Because I think that if you know those things, it gives you the courage of your convictions and it allows you to make take big swings. That's a big thing that I think holds people back. Then the other thing I would say is not being careful enough about the people that they surround themselves with. Mm. The biggest thing that has helped me jump so quickly in my career, because if you look at it, and I tell a lot of people this, my career is not normal. The way that I rose up so quickly, I mean, I joke when I say this is act two of my career. I'm only 31 years old. And so do all the things that I was able to do at 31 and now be doing this uh, was not by accident. It was because success leaves clues. When I looked at certain people, I was like, okay, this person is successful. How do I find somebody like that in my circle? And so I got very, very selective with who I surrounded myself with. And I think that's something that we are too, as a society, we are too free with who we allow access to us. You have to understand what you're consuming, what you work on works on you. It's hard to be positive around a negative person. True that. I'm very careful about how I choose my friends. I'm very careful about how I choose who I go into business with, who I spend time with. And my social media feeds is another big thing because I have to spend so much time on there as a business owner now and, and right. marketing and promoting. I went through and unfollowed so many people. Like I was like, if I haven't gotten value from this person. It's been really easy to do that the last couple of years. Yeah, <laughs> That's the blessing. <laughs> yeah, people really put it out there and showed you who they were over the past couple exactly. of years. But those things I think can drastically change your life. So what's the best advice you've ever been given? Wow. Oh, that's a tough, that's a tough question. That's a great question. Yeah. When you work in sports, you get along. <laughs> that, that's a great question. The best piece of advice. <laughs> Try to pinpoint which one. <laughs> I have two probably. The first one came at a point in my life that I wasn't ready to hear it, but it was one of the most important things I've ever heard. It was my head coach in college. I had lunch with him recently, actually. And I asked him, you know, why didn't you ever kick me off the team? Like I was a nightmare. Why, why didn't I know I was talented. I know I was this, I know I was that, but he should have got rid of me. Like now as a coach, I look at it and I'm like, why did you keep me? He joked about it and he said, you needed the game more than, more than the game needed you, which he was hundred percent right about. But the best piece of advice he ever gave me was we were sitting in his office and I was complaining to him, basically asking why I wasn't playing. And he said, at some point in your life, you need to realize and you need to learn how to be the guy instead of being that guy. Uh -huh. And 
at the time I had no idea what he meant. I was like, all right, listen to this old guy yelling at me. Like, all right, cool, man. But now looking back on that, I'm like, wow, that was really profound. That was something that I needed at that time. So that was one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten. The second one came from a former boss of mine and a former colleague of mine at UNLV, Sean Manuel, who, if you haven't heard of him, he played for the 49ers in the 90s. Him and his twin brother both played in the NFL. Phenomenal guy. One of the most unapologetically authentic human beings I've ever met. He shows up with his scars and flaws and everything, and he is not afraid to discuss it. And he is principle-based and he's just a great human being. He told me I was struggling my first year in Division One. I was just struggling. It was just so much. The pressure was getting to me. I was stressed out all the time. I wasn't sleeping. I was, you know, literally coming to the office at four o'clock in the morning, leaving at 10 o'clock at night. I would eat a half of Papa John's pizza on the way home. And then I would literally sleep on the floor of my apartment because I wouldn't even make it to my bed. I mean, it was a grind. It's a lot of pressure. Yeah, it was a ton of pressure under pressure. And I had never felt that before. And he said to me one day, I can see your dragon. I'm just going to tell you this and you can take it for what it is. He said, sit in the pressure and let it do its work. You will be happy with the person you become if you stay in this long enough. Wow. And that was profound to me. And so now that's something that I tell to everybody, just sit in it just a little bit longer, a little bit longer, because there's so many times in life where you just want to quit and you don't know how close you are. If you just stay in it just a little bit longer, you're going to get to where you want to get to. And if you don't get to where you want to get to, you just built a skill that's going to help you get even further than you originally wanted. Well, I don't even know if we can top that. (laughs) I had one more question, but I don't know if we could top that. (laughs) I was going to ask you, one, is there one action people can do today that can move themselves forward and i think you just said it (laughs) yeah yeah if i had to narrow it down to an action i would say get out a piece of paper write down the values that you believe are your core values the things that you believe are your core values in life then next to that write down a column that says habit and then write down a column that says daily behavior and i want you to actually be honest with yourself and say, okay, if I say that my value, so for instance, one of my values is that I'm committed to growth. Growth is a value in my life. I fight for it. So my habit is that I maintain being a lifelong learner. I maintain a beginner's mindset with things. I'm always looking for for new opportunities and new ways to do things. My daily behaviors are that I wake up every day, I meditate, I journal, I work out, I read. Those things I do regardless. The other thing I do is I connect with somebody that I care about every single day. So if you can't come up with a habit and a daily behavior, an example of the things that you do, it's not your true value. So be honest with yourself and figure out what are your core values? Who are you at your core? And then go from there. That's the one thing that you can do today that could literally set you up for the next 20, 30 years of your life. Wow. That is so amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, I love doing this. I love connecting with people and, and having the conversation. So I appreciate it. Thank you.